Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Financing the Net Zero Future. We've got a terrific panel for you today to discuss the challenges and opportunities to unlock the 50 trillion of financing that we'll need over the coming decades to accelerate into a net zero future. Before introducing our uh, outstanding panelists, I'd first like to share with you a video pre-recorded by John Wharton, climate counselor to the secretary of the US Department of Treasury, who was unable to join us, but wanted to share with us this short message. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And thanks to the World Economic Forum for inviting me to say a few opening words at the top of this panel on financing the net zero future. As the climate counselor to US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, I spend each day working with experts from across the department to leverage Treasury's tools and authorities to affect and enable the transition to this administration's goal of a net zero emissions economy. The challenges posed by climate change are daunting, but as this audience knows very well, there are extraordinary economic opportunities embedded in the transition to a lower carbon and ultimately net zero economy. And the question is not whether this transition will occur, but rather how quickly, who will lead and who will be left behind? And these are questions not just of tremendous environmental consequence, but tremendous economic consequence. Fortunately, the trends in both public and private markets are clear and positive. Countries representing now three quarters, nearly three quarters of global emissions have made net zero commitments by mid-century, and many are backing those up with strong 2030 targets along the way. And nearly half of global assets under management are now attached to mid-century net zero commitments as well. These commitments are meaningful, but must be followed by concrete measurable actions. And today we know that market participants are contending with significant data and information gaps and would benefit from more clarity on what sorts of investment opportunities are consistent with low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient pathways. Supporting the flow of capital towards activities that are consistent with these pathways requires building an ecosystem of data, information, practices, and procedures that enable financial markets market actors to fully integrate climate consideration into their decisions. This information is critical for pension fund managers, as well as pensioners who want their investments to align with their values. The public sector plays a pivotal role in helping to inform, guide, and de-risk private capital flows for alignment with climate goals and to ultimately unlock trillions of dollars of climate finance. I'd like to briefly highlight three Treasury-led initiatives that are seeking to do just that. First, Secretary Yellen chairs the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, a grouping of the U.S. 15 independent financial regulators. As specified in President Biden's May executive order on climate-related financial risk, Treasury is leading an FSOC process to issue a report to the President on member agency efforts to integrate consideration of climate-related risk in their policies and programs. This assessment will include reporting on any actions the Council recommends to mitigate risks to financial stability and enhance climate-related disclosures. And you should expect to see this report and assessment in the weeks ahead. Second, Treasury is co-chairing with China, the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, where we are working with our G20 counterparts to improve information on climate-related financial risks and opportunities, to enhance the interoperability of tools and approaches to align investments to climate goals, and to encourage the multilateral development banks to align their operations with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And finally, Treasury is working with the leadership of the multilateral development banks directly to raise the ambition of their private climate finance mobilization targets to increase MDB support to address technology risk in developing countries, to enhance developing country domestic green bond markets, and to increase support for climate adaptation work, among other issues. Strategic de-risking of private capital for climate purposes must become a bigger part of the MDB agenda. More generally, of course, the Biden administration has proposed an historic climate investment agenda represented most immediately in the bipartisan infrastructure deal and current reconciliation proposals. Both packages would lead to historic amounts of public capital for mitigation and adaptation, and adaptation through, for example, increasing the resiliency of our infrastructure to a changing climate, 
constructing thousands of miles of new trans transmission lines to accommodate the addition of more renewable energy, and investing in a nationwide electric vehicle charging network. These investments represent the best chance we have to turbocharge the U.S. economy towards a low carbon future and to position our industry and job base for strong and sustained growth for the decades ahead. And we call upon Congress to pass the bipartisan infrastructure deal and the president's FY22 budget as soon as possible. But ultimately, our success in confronting, in both confronting the climate challenge and in harnessing the economic opportunities embedded in the net zero transition will be about how fast private markets move and adjust. We know that. And we applaud the leadership of those firms that are leading the charge. And we encourage those who are still sitting on the fence to recognize the pace and inevitability of the transition of folding, unfolding around us and to take quick and decisive action. Thanks very much again for the opportunity to speak with you today. Well, that was a terrific introduction by John. So it falls to me to introduce our terrific panel today. Celine Herver, the Group Chief Sustainable Officer for HSBC. Torben Morgan Pedersen, the Chief Executive of Pension Denmark. And Leslie Masdorf, Vice President and CFO of the New Development Bank in China. So before getting into the meat of this, I really want to ask you a question about your sort of motivation. Could you briefly share with us what motivates you to work to accelerate climate adaptation within finance? Uh, maybe, Celine, if I start with you uh, first. Sure, and hi, Lou. Great to join for the panel today. Um, I think what motivates me, I mean, I've, I've actually recently switched from, you know, a decade of working one of the big four um, in a similar kind of um, sustainability leadership role into the Group Chief Sustainability Officer role at HSBC. And, and for me, it was a no-brainer because finance is really what shapes the future. You know, we've got the biggest industrial transformation ahead in, in the next decade across every sector, where finance goes, where money goes. And HSBC is a bank, you know, we have such a big footprint in emerging markets where the challenge uh, is going to be the greatest in terms of the decarbonisation pathway ahead. And if you look at future emissions growth, 90% of that is in emerging markets. So, um, you know, a very exciting opportunity to get a systemic shift in finance, obviously. Torben. And, uh, well, uh, thank you both to, to, to you and also to uh, John Morrison for this very inspiring uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, as uh, Celine pointed out, uh, well, uh, to achieve the uh, ambitious goals from the, the Paris Accord, we have to mobilize private capital on a large scale, which fits actually very well into the uh, purposes and uh, and a goal for a long-term investor like a pension fund like, like ours. And to make it a little, to give you a philosophical example, I mean, a young member entering Pension Denmark's pension scheme this year may be a 20-year-old female carpenter. And she will retire in, in 50 years' time, that means in the, something about 2070, 2071, and as, he, as a, a Female, she probably will have a life expectancy for a further 30 years. So she will be around in my pension scheme to the uh, to the other end of this uh, century. So we are actually investing on a very long term basis. And when I uh, I want to provide her with a, a, a nice good pension when she retires, but also to uh, make my contribution to make sure that she can retire in an, in a world which is worth living in, so to say. So for long term investors like us, I think we have a, as an extra level of uh, uh, obligations uh, to uh, focus on the, the impact of what we're doing. And uh, uh, luckily, uh, uh, but not surprisingly, uh, the, uh, the green transition is not only a, a, a challenge for, for mankind, it's also a as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, you a very attractive opportunity for long-term investors like us, especially in an environment where we are confronted with uh, uh, zero or minus uh, uh, interest rates uh, level and, uh, and, uh, and uh, stock markets have been getting quite expensive during the last uh, uh, few years. So actually looking for alternatives, the, the green transition opens up a very attractive investment universe, also for those of uh, for those in, in in my industry, maybe not that convinced of the necessity of uh, taking uh, 
checking in on the, on the climate situation, but from a purely let's say, investment perspective, uh, if you will ask the C uh, CIOs, you will also get a strong support to uh, uh, our engagement in this area. That's terrific. Well, that's a really inspiring way to start by thinking about the, next, the rest of this century. Um, Leslie, if I just pick up with you about some motivation and, and, and your own contribution. Thank you very much, uh, you, for this uh, opportunity. You know, every day when I, mean, I wake up and uh, we deal here as a new development bank with the large emerging markets of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. I am from uh, South Africa, as you uh, might know, and uh, these issue, issues are deeply uh, personal, if you like. You know, in South Africa, we still have a, a, a energy grid system that's 90% dependent on uh, coal. Uh, if I look at all of these uh, provinces where the coal mines, where the uh, the coal five power stations are located, I mean, I can just see the dislocation and the immense social and economic and employment impacts that the climate transition uh, will have in the country where I'm from. We already have uh, north of 30% official unemployment uh, in South Africa. So the potential of further dislocation and potential massive even social and other instability arising from a transition that is not potentially just. So that's one of the the key issues that I would like to flag in our conversation today, the need to ensure that the principle of what is called the just transition in the Paris Agreement on climate change, that the frameworks and that the detail is, is ironed out. Because I would argue uh, uh, you that as much as the uh, investor community have now incorporated climate risk into their investment decision making, I think social inequality is not really seen also as as important a systemic risk going forward. That's super. Well, look, maybe just reflecting on John's comments, I mean, I think John held out sort of three challenges. The first was to reform and evolve the development bank's uh, um, a role to do more in emerging markets, was to mobilize capital on a global scale to, for investment, and third, to enhance the data and disclosures. So maybe, Leslie, if I can turn to you first, as you think about the role the, uh, the development banks can play, how can, you know, how, how are you thinking about John's rallying call for you know, development banks to do more. I think uh, John Morton is spot on that we have to go back to the drawing boards you to uh, to uh, evaluate how effective our existing institutions are and whether the design of the entire business model in the development uh, finance world ought to be uh, relooked really at. Um, as you know, there's a very high degree of consensus that the um, focus of multilateral banks ought to shift away from direct lending and more to be de-risking machines, to be uh, um, to use our high credit worthiness, if you like, to improve the risk return profile in sustainable infrastructure projects so that we can crowd in the large pools of institutional investor money. We have battled for years, though, to resolve this conundrum, uh, you. There's, been, there's such a high degree of consensus that mobilization of, of private sector capital has to be at the center of this uh, agenda. We just have not been successful yet in designing new financial instruments, in coming up with new finance solutions to be able to do that. For example, multilateral banks, because we are all uh, either AA plus or AAA uh, rated, we can do considerably more credit enhancement, where instead of us financing project directly, we take the first loss uh, guarantee piece, if you like, in the capital stack, and then enable institutional investors to come in and take the uh, senior debt uh, piece, which then uh, will be priced lower because of the lower risk. And in that way, we can improve a lot more funding to developing uh, countries. In short, what I'm saying is that we need to go back to first principles to ask some of the basic questions, whether the way we are structured at the moment is uh, optimal whether there isn't scope for us to redesign our existing uh, institutions. Just a couple of days ago, I heard in one of the webinars that Kenneth Rogoff, for example, argues that we need a dedicated World Carbon Bank because he's arguing with many others that the existing institutions are not suitably sort of organized to take on this new global uh, challenge to lead the world towards a low carbon uh, future because we have so many other mandates as part of our overall um, ambition. So that would be my, my first comment. That's very helpful, Leslie. Maybe, Celine, maybe if I could ask you to uh, respond to John's second challenge, which was around data and disclosure. Clearly, it's improving, but as you sit you know, leading a bank's effort, 
what, where, where do you think it needs to go next and what are you looking for? Yeah, I, well, I mean, let's start with where banks are in terms of their headline commitments right now, because there's there's been a huge kind of shift recently. We've, we've got, I think, in, if we look at the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which is kind of ahead of the COP meeting in something like five weeks' time now, I think we have something like 53 banks now who've committed to net zero as part of that group, right? Um, and so what does it mean as a bank when you commit to net zero? Again, we all know really the fundamental thing is around finance emissions, right? And so we're actually committing that our finance emissions are going to reach net zero before 2050, which is massive. That's a transformation, right, of any single bank in terms of the way it does um, financing and investment. Um, you know, so when I look at the bank that I'm in, that means, you know, what does that mean for global banking? What does it mean for global markets, for commercial banking, where we, we kind of bank the kind of mid market uh, clients for wealth, you know, for mass affluent wealth, for kind of ultra high net worth, for asset management, thinking about the implications of transitioning that portfolio are huge. And the starting point for us, and this probably builds on where Leslie was going in terms of, you know, the inclusive transition, that the starting point for us has to be on working in partnership with our clients on that massive industrial transformation ahead. Right. It's it's investment to finance that transition with divestment as a very last resort. And so to be able to do that, well, what does that mean? We've made the commitment, but it now need, means we need to start engaging with all of our you know, big institutional clients on their climate transition plans, right? So we need to be able to judge the validity of those plans, to advise them on the validity, to offer financing instruments, to incentivize performance around KPIs that showcase decarbonization, to help them finance um, you know, interesting new climate tech uh, m a projects, for example, or sustainable infrastructure investments. So it's really a, a whole set of new capability we need to build into the bank. And on the data side, that's key because, you know, to be able to assess where clients are in terms of the transition plans, we need good data. We're probably getting that quite well for some of the kind of largest clients within global banking. But when we start to kind of go down the level at HSBC, if I think about oil and gas sector clients, we've got 25% of state-owned, public sector-owned um, you know, and private, and the data challenge is much harder there. And then you go all the way down into the SMEs and MSMEs as well. So I think data is going to be key, not just in terms of what, you know, the kind of what the emissions are, but also client transition, what their plans are, how they're integrating it into business models, and then being able to aggregate that all up at a portfolio level so we can look at over the years, are we meeting our targets across sectors in terms of our decarbonization pathways? So huge help needed there, and also in terms of standardization on, on what data, because we have to be asking for the same requests as all of our peers and all, and all of the asset managers as well. Super. And then, Torben, I mean, John also alluded to a point you made about uh, the investment opportunities and risk and mobilizing on a global playbook. Um, I'd be interested in your perspectives on that. And in particular, as one of the leading European firms, you know, are you holding emerging market investments to the same standards as the ones in Europe? Or, or how are you thinking through the global dimension to your portfolio? Well, uh, uh, I certainly agree with, with, uh, with Jim Martin uh, and actually also on, on Leslie's point on the uh, need to, let's say, develop the concept uh, in the development banks to be, become attractive uh, partners and, and risk-sharing partners uh, when we are talking about investments in, in emerging markets. And I think that uh, so all, I think the, the way forward in this area is to uh, further develop the concept of uh, blended finance uh, vehicles, which have been uh, in use now for a few years uh, in, in, in a number of countries. In, in Denmark, we have established uh, a blended finance structure where we are working together with the, the uh, Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs. They, their uh, DFI uh, provides 50% of capital to a structure where we provide because of other countries, we have other 50%. We have a, a risk share program very similar to what uh, Leslie mentioned, where the government uh, part of the uh, structure has some kind of uh, first loss position. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, they might end up with a larger return actually on their investment than, than we have, because we have traded away some of the risk uh, uh, paid by giving uh, away some of the, the upside in the structure. And the, by this uh, 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 approach, we can mobilize very large uh, pools of private capital because you, have, uh, uh, you end up with a risk return profile, which is very similar to what you uh, perceive is uh, possible in, in Europe, uh, US. And we've actually been able to invest in a number of uh, very, let's say, promising projects in, 
Yine böyle cuma geçti. Ya şu meyce muhatır the Lake Chukana Wild Park in Kenya which is uh, now the, the, the largest uh, wind, uh, offshore wind park in Africa, providing uh, Kenya with, I think, 20% of uh, Kenya's uh, power uh, demand is uh, financed in, in, in this structure. So we as a, a Danish-based petrol farm, we are actually now a co-owner of a, a, a large wind farm in, uh, in, in, in Kenya, uh, because the overall risk structure has been uh, designed in a I say, I think uh, quite an uh, optimal uh, way, and uh, I think that's the way going forward. And and uh, I want to give a small remark to to, to Leslie's uh, intervention. Well, I, I certainly agree that we have to uh, find ways to get uh, development banks involved and even a larger scale. But I I think I, I will be a little bit uh, skeptical on your idea of uh, a, a total redesign of the institutional structure. I mean. There are so few, we have short time. I mean, 2030 is uh, eight, nine years down the, down the road. I don't think we should waste our time with a complicated uh, redesign of institutions, uh, of institutions that takes tons of time. Uh, I think we should uh, use the existing structure and uh, find ways, although they may not be on a long term optimal, but the, although uh, uh, reachable. To, to, to get the uh, to, to established structures, we can finance the necessary investments in especially renewable energy and, uh, and adaption uh, infrastructure, both emerging markets but also in the US. And I think in, in this perspective, we should be, as investors, be very uh, optimistic on all the co investment uh, opportunities created by both the, the, the Biden administration's uh, uh, infrastructure plan. Uh, Uh, as mentioned by John Bob Olson, also uh, by the uh, even, uh, although even as, as ambitious uh, European plan uh, by the European Commission, uh, where you have uh, put up uh, 750 billion uh, euros uh, to invest in, uh, among other things, uh, the, the green uh, transition in, in, in Europe. And for the first time, th this, this uh, program is financed by issuing uh, European bonds. So it's backed up by Uh, EU, not uh, by the individual member states, we did a very bold uh, step in making uh, transforming into the European Union to be an active player in uh, providing, uh, let's say, fiscal stimulus, but also providing uh, finance to, to, to infrastructure program. So I think that uh, we have actually we have a, a quite soft spot now. We have plenty of funding from public uh, sources available in the US and in, in Europe. We have the development banks being ready to step in at the large scale in emerging markets. And we have uh, organizations like mine uh, uh, seeing very attractive opportunities in this, in this area. So I think the, 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 the final message is to, uh, we should now uh, move from uh, all these nice talks in uh, WEF and other places and make some concrete actions. I mean, we are in a position now we have to be doers, not talkers. Super. Well, look, uh, Torben, I think that's a very good challenge. So let's move to sort of doing rather than talking here. But, but can I just give a note uh, to everyone listening in today? If there's any questions you would like me to ask the panellists, feel free to sort of pop in your uh, questions into the uh, link. Um, so maybe, Celine, if I can come on to this sort of, you know, doing. Um, uh, so one topic we were debating is um, what are the key friction points which are slowing down or impeding capital flowing to transition finance, which, you know, you know, if you like, so if I may turn to you, if you had one idea or, or maybe two ideas of, of areas of friction, which you think we can address to speed up or expand the pace of capital flow to transition finance. Maybe, Celine, if I start to you and then I'll come to you, Leslie. I mean, I, I probably would, I think so, it's a good question, but I probably would kind of first start by building on what both what Leslie and Torben said, which is, you know, public, especially when we're looking at emerging market finance, you know, we would love to invest more in sustainable infrastructure. You know, the challenge, the long challenge has been around for a long time has been, again, the lack of a, a bankable, big enough pipeline of sustainable infrastructure projects, right? And so that comes into the role of the MDBs again, and it's what Leslie touched upon in the beginning, because actually, you know, MDBs have limited balance sheets. So rather than focusing on kind of, direct kind of lending 
space, right? The more that we can think about public finance mechanisms to mitigate risks and to help develop the pipeline itself in terms of technical assistance um, type, you know, project facilities and things like that, that can help um, in a way kind of open the pipeline and structure the right kind of deals. We're working um, with a number of different actors, including the IFC, OECD, Climate Policy Institute and others on a new uh, label that's going to be launched called Fast Infra, which is all about coming up with a, a labeling for the sustainable infrastructure types of investments to create a more liquid asset class there of bankable projects uh, and a kind of tech platform, um, which a number of tech partners are, are helping with as well to, to then kind of almost get all the project financiers together in this particular space. And, and the idea really is we want to get to a point where any, you know, any sustainable infrastructure asset has got that kind of common label, which builds on the EU taxonomy. There's just a bit more clarity of investments. And then we have PFMs coming in to kind of back that as well. I mean, for me, the other side is, you know, the, there's also a big technology play. We've got, if you think about technologies, 2030, up to 2030, we've kind of sold for those technologies. It's about kind of scaling what we kind of have, have from 2030 to 2040 to 2050. By 2050, half of those technologies aren't yet kind of um, in development or at prototype stage. So there's another big, uh, you know, role here for financiers to think about those deep decarbonization technologies and how can we bring them from kind of venture stage through growth stage and upward so that they can actually be deployed in terms of transition. And that's a completely different type of finance. So the kind of things that we're getting involved in there include project finance and public-private partnerships um, in the spaces like, you know, green hydrogen, long-term battery storage, green um, sustainable aviation fuels. But also we're looking at the venture ecosystem um, and actually setting up. There's a lot of interest now in climate tech, which is the kind of the 2020s reinvention of the 20, 2000s, you know, clean tech, which was a very monolithic area around energy. Climate tech cuts across all of the different sectors. It's the fastest growing uh, investment theme within the venture capital community. It's about scaling these types of, um, of companies. It's 16 billion, I think, in the first half of this year of investment in that climate tech space. So we're starting to look at, we're launching a new um, venture growth strategy around how we help those climate tech companies grow and a number of different funds uh, in our asset management group for that space as well. So there are many different areas, but I just focus on sustainable infrastructure and climate tech to give a starter. That's right. Fantastic. Um, so, Leslie, biggest source of friction and, and, and opportunities to, to solve it? The first one, uh, Celine has already uh, covered, which is the need for a standardized, harmonized uh, approach to what is sustainable uh, infrastructure so that investors, institutional investors and so on, can have confidence and comfort that if something is labeled uh, sustainable, that it is indeed uh, sustainable and that it meets their uh, ESG uh, criteria. So the creation of, a, of a, 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 a distinct asset class, as Celine mentioned, is one of the key uh, friction points uh, and the industry, as she mentioned, we're already working uh, on that. The second key point, as I uh, mentioned earlier on, is that most uh, investment, um, uh, so, so when you look at the emerging markets, rather, many of them suffer from the fact that they are lower down on the credit spectrum and they do not meet the regulatory requirements of large institutional uh, uh, investors. So playing this, this role, this credit enhancement role of multilateral banks is a very, very crucial piece. We need to increasingly, as I said, move away from our focus on direct lending to use our balance sheet much more through uh, credit enhancement. The third one is, as you know, institutional investors would not invest in one single project in one country, like in a solar project in Egypt or in uh, South Africa. Uh, it would be much more efficient to do those uh, investments on a portfolio basis. And again, uh, there's successful experiments, uh, in, in successful investment platforms in this regard. The uh, IFC, for example, have a particular platform called MCPP. Um, uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction Development have similar type of approaches. The, it will be much more effective for us to find the necessary uh, investment platforms to crowd in investments on a portfolio uh, basis. And then also, I would argue, thirdly, you, that the insurance and the reinsurance industry also offers great uh, potential. There's risk by bearing capacity. The insurance industry in particular, their business model is about understanding risk. We need to make greater use as a development finance industry to work closely with the, uh, the insurance and, and reinsurance industry. And in that regard, we have the political risk coverage 
vehicle called MIGA, for example, which sits in the World Bank, but it only serves the World Bank, if you like. We could use a political risk coverage mechanism more broadly for the MDB system. So taking a view about the multilateral banks as a system and how we can nurture the complementarities and the comparative advantages of each of the individual institutions um, and putting that to more effective uh, use. And maybe just finally, I agree fully with uh, Tobin, before we create new institutions, we should make our existing institutions more um, uh, effective. The question, though, is are they all still fit for purpose and is there a need for some re-engineering was more the question I was uh, posing. Super. Well, that's really helpful. That's a great touch of ideas. I mean, Torben, maybe come back to the, so the question was sort of biggest frictions and, and ways to, to, to try and smooth them out, in your view. Well, I think that, uh, as uh, Leslie put it, an important uh, element uh, to, to also to, uh, reach out to the insurance industry to use, use uh, their capacities to mitigate the uh, certain uh, risks. Uh, when we are investing in rich markets, we in general are uh, a big user of, uh, of, of uh, MIGA uh, for, for the World Bank. And it's, uh, I think it's a relatively effective, also cost-effective way to get rid of some of the risks which we can't uh, handle, I mean, the political risk uh, type of, uh, of issues. And I, I think I, I agree with Leslie, maybe we should make uh, the uh, insurance element in the uh, in investing in those long-term infrastructure projects uh, more visible and uh, more uh, easy accessible for, for uh, investors. So we, when we present a project for a group of investors, we are already at, from the very beginning have included the design of uh, proper insurance elements uh, in the structure. That could be a, a, a mitigator. And I also think that it's important to, to think of uh, the, the, the public-private partnership uh, dimension uh, my, uh, our experience uh, investing in emerging markets is that when we are investing together with uh, governments, as a, uh, from as a, let's say the Danish government or other uh, European governments, uh, we have a very strong uh, risk reduction structure. Uh, because maybe uh, someone out there uh, would not be that uh, uh, frightened to uh, to to to. Uh, <laughs> To, to, to make some, uh, to, to uh, have a relation, to have a, a, a conflict with a, a small uh, Danish pension fund. But if they also have, uh, at the same time, a conflict with uh, the Danish government, which is a big uh, supplier of, uh, of aid, uh, the picture is uh, somewhat uh, different. So uh, investing as a private investor together with, uh, with the government is also, a, it's not that easy to quantify, but it's, it's a very, I think, important. Uh, risk mitigator uh, uh, parameter, and maybe it should be used in an even larger scale because, not just because of, uh, to, to support us, but because this is a way to get leverage to the, the public funding available for, uh, for, for aid, aid pro programs in, in the emerging uh, market. So, in general, I think that which is fully in line with the, let's say, you know, values of uh, World Human Forum, we should uh, uh, maybe uh, explore, or make a deep dive into the perspective of an even uh, uh, more uh, comprehensive uh, public-private approach to generate uh, capital for, for relevant infrastructure projects in rich markets. Thank you, Torben. That's very helpful. So one question I get asked a lot is that, you know, finance, as the three of you have argued today, is pivoting. And, and I think in particular in the last 12 months, they're starting to see the opportunities, not just the risks of climate finance, climate change, but public policy is still um, not pivoting as fast. And in particular, I think we can all agree that many democracies struggle between solving today's problems and tomorrow's. Carbon taxes is a good example where very few democracies have, have got them in place. If you had one big idea of, where, of public policy which would help the flow of private capital uh, or would help the flow of capital, what, what might that be? Uh, maybe, Torben, if I can start with you as you're on camera. So, 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 so asking what were, were the challenges of public policy is not always consistent with the flow of capital to net zero. What would, more would you like to see from the European government, for instance, to get to help capital to flow? 
from uh, from my point of view, I think that, that we have strong institutions in, in Europe. I mean, the uh, European Investment Bank uh, and also the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, based in, in London, are very strong and uh, institutions with a long track record and a, a strong uh, legacy. And they have a, 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 a strong uh, let's say, engagement and commitment to facilitate, let's say, uh, private uh, investments in, in this uh, area. So I, I don't think, uh, as I mentioned before, we, we, we're not in a lack of institutions, but uh, maybe we should, uh, let's say, uh, make priorities uh, a little bit more uh, uh, clear. And, and if, from a European perspective, uh, you might have the point that there have been, uh, in the recent, let's say, two years, uh, been a really too much uh, focus on uh, restarting the European economy and the using the, uh, the big recovery plan for, for this purpose and uh, maybe too little uh, attention on how the European Union and the European Investment Bank and other institutions can uh, uh, increase their support for uh, all the necessary investments in, in the emerging markets. So, yeah, you, 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 I think you have a point there, yeah. Okay. Uh, Sreen, any policy risks which you think are slowing down the flow of capital to transition? I mean, I think those of us working on climate policy know it's like a whole landscape of policy levers we need to be using, right? Um, you know, starting with the macro one, which is actually does the government, you know, you know, does it have a net zero by 2050 target in line with science? And how does that flow down towards sectoral level strategies and policies, right? And how robust does that flow down in terms of a roadmap? So I think, you know, we've kind of, there's a lot there. I think in terms of doing the day job, it's helpful, you know, obviously for banks and those that need to manage this transition to have a disclosure mandate. So we get the data we need from our clients uh, in a clearer way to be able to kind of engage with them and track how that's happening and really kind of make some judgments around the transition and validity of the transition. I mean, the other thing also, we, we're talking about a lot about emerging countries. And I think, you know, so in terms of moving the energy mix, we're going to see some interesting conversations happening at COP in five weeks. But, um, you know, there's some some more movement around now around the support that can be provided between East, West and North and South around early coal retirement, right? Because there's a move towards the phase out dates of 2030 OECD, 2040 non OECD, but actually do need an element of. Um, of abated coal in the, in the mix after 2040, but actually how do you retire effectively all of those young coal assets in many Asian economies, right, who, you know, in many cases it's only 10 years old, and actually what support can be provided so that we, we actually get a kind of managed transition in that respect, and, and there's some really interesting kind of public private financing mechanisms that are coming through there. So, yeah, a variety of answers. I can't give you the one silver bullet, I'm afraid. A, a high carbon price would be nice, but we know that, <laughs> that uh, you know, there is no silver bullet. Uh, and so maybe turning to you, uh, Leslie, are the, you know, what are the most, poli you know, critical issues in po public policy that you would you would see would help um, the flow of capital in, in, in your area? I think firstly, um, as you know, uh, many governments now, I think half of the world's GDP are produced in countries that have net zero uh, targets. A net zero commitment is clearly a very important one. And as we go towards COP26, we're going to see that number of countries uh, are increasing. However, what is required, as you know, Hugh, is for that to be codified in transition plans that are, for example, focused on 2030 and even uh, earlier. So much more detailed level granular plans are required at a public policy level which will inspire the uh, change that needs to happen in the rest of the uh, economy. The second biggest uh, gap, I would argue, uh, Hugh, is in the space of regulation and supervision. I mean, as you know, there's already a discussion among central banks that came out recently with the uh, uh, book on uh, Green Swan, where they effectively argued that the role and mandate of central banks have to be reconfigured. Monetary policy and the way interest rates are set have to be geared towards the net zero uh, world. In a similar way, these rules of the game will help the private sector to be uh, to act within the newly defined uh, uh, rules. And then finally, I mean, I would also uh, again want to re-emphasize the point I made around the just uh, transition. I think that we are potentially going to have significant uh, transitional challenges, if you like, when we look at the impact on emerging uh, markets. I mean, as you know, uh, and, and Torben already highlighted about Europe, I mean, I would say Europe is probably the leader out there, undisputed climate leader with respect to the uh, sophistication of the policies that have been uh, developed already have, for example, a transition fund. Um, 
I, I don't know of many other or any other sort of continents or regions where there are such detailed plans uh, in place. Um, and the reason why I emphasize this is because whilst you can retire coal plants in um, uh, Europe, in many parts of Africa, we are still so dependent on those coal-fired jobs.